Bonjour, Monsieur, Dame. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very pleased to welcome you here for our debate on Europe. I'm Christian Schubert. I'm a German uh, journalist uh, for Allgemeine Zeitung. Thank you for being here and for being online and on the screens. I hope that the connection will work well. The, has the EU taken its real meaning in the face of adversity? That's the topic we'll be dealing with today. Over the last 18 months, we've encountered a huge challenge across the board, particularly the EU, because the EU is a unique entity. It's the big, biggest economic uh, area in the world. It's the biggest economic area without borders. As you know, however, the EU is a mixture of independent states. It's based on what we call supranationality. Decisions are sometimes taken in Brussels, sometimes in capital cities. So we had Brexit, another event which has been very difficult to manage. What will happen? What will ensue? I'm very pleased to have with me a number of experts and some experts online too. I'll start by introducing our speakers. First of all, we're very pleased to have the Minister for the Economy from Portugal with us. Pedro Cisa Vieira, who is the Minister of the Economy and uh, Digital Transition in Portugal. He's a lawyer by training. He has taught at university as a con an economist. He was also Deputy Minister to the Prime Minister. And it's very interesting to hear his viewpoint because Portugal has just had the presidency of the EU over the last six months. Then we'll come back here in the flesh and blood. And next to me, we have Florence Nina, who is a lawyer and works for the Ellen and Govery firm, which specializes in European law and competition law. She's also a specialist in energy and questions of, of financing and digital matters. Olivier Klein is an economist by training. He's a teacher, a professor of macroeconomics, and also, of course, he manages and he's uh, director general of a big French bank, which belongs uh, to the BPC. And then we have Paul Yeager, who works for Russell and Reynolds, which is a firm that specializes in um, headhunting executive staff, and your passion is Europe. You have managed, you are Director General of Information at the uh, European Commission in Paris. And on our right, we have Philippe Martin, who is a member of the Circle of Economists. He's an economist by training, of course. And he has worked for the Fed in New York. And of course, he is president, uh, CEO of the Council of Economic and Now Analysts. And uh, oh, we'll start with a few words of introduction. Sorry, I forgot something. We also have Mrs. Lika Fries. Lika Fries will be joining us from Denmark. Lika Fries is a researcher, and she's a woman politician. She has been Minister for the Climate, Minister for Energy, and she's a researcher. She manages the think tank Europa in Denmark. Thank you for joining us here today. I'll give the floor 
to uh, Philippe Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll start by saying a, a few words and reacting to the way in which Europe has uh, reacted to the COVID crisis. A few negative comments on certain points, but also I'll make a positive point. Europe has learned from its mistakes, and in particular the mistakes made during the major financial crisis. So thanks to this experience, a consensus has gathered after the financial crisis and was useful during the epidemic. Europe had a very quick budgetary reaction. It wasn't always coordinated, but it was fairly consistent in terms of uh, you know, furloughing uh, employees that worked in particular in Germany and elsewhere. I'll talk about it a bit later on because there is a debate on the budgetary reaction. Now, budgetary rules have been frozen. That's a very good thing. That made it possible to protect households and to protect companies. And that's why there's no problem with demand as we emerge from the crisis, is because there was a recovery plan during the crisis which protected both supply and demand. So I think that uh, in the face of this crisis, and we have a crisis about every 10 years, and people have learned that it's necessary to react extremely quickly and in a very strong, powerful way. And that indeed is what was done from a budgetary stance and a monetary stance as well. If you compare what was done in the 2009 crisis, we had to wait for 2012 for the European Central Bank uh, to uh, really uh, realize how major the crisis was. It took time for it to realize that the uh, EU might uh, splinter. So in this case, uh, it was clear that uh, it was necessary to react extremely quickly. And there was a massive purchasing uh, program. So we're in an economic, uh, macroeconomic situation, which is very different from a budgetary and monetary stance, thanks to these very quick responses. It wasn't a banking crisis either. I think at a given point in time, at the beginning of the crisis, people were worried when you have an economic uh, and health uh, crisis of that scope. We could have feared there might be a banking crisis as well, but there was none. We don't really know why it wasn't the case, obviously. Uh, there are 30% fewer bankruptcies in, in France, uh, probably across Europe reforms, banking reforms, which took place after the uh, 2009 financial crisis played an important part, of course, in addition to monetary policy. As to the next generation EU, as you know, it's not a short-term plan. It's a long-term plan that's been implemented. I think there are some shortcomings. What really disappointed me, of course, I'm not at all objective, I, I'm a university professor, but I was extremely disappointed to see there was no plan for public research in the crisis. It was clear that we were really uh, lagging behind in many areas of innovation compared with the uh, US and China. We should have had a major European plan, yet there is absolutely nothing in terms of public research. I'm a great fine, a, a fan of the Grand Research Council, which helped uh, to develop uh, one or two of the new vaccines. It helps researchers and enables researchers to uh, return from the U.S., but there was no increase in budget for that entity. And I think that's a major shortcoming also at a European level. If you compare with the U.S., for example, there is a considerable gap between a difference between the U.S. recovery plan and the uh, EU one. You can talk about the uh, EU uh, and U.S. recovery plan, which co who copied who, but there are any number of problems. There's an imbalance, for example, between the U.S. and Europe. There is a trade uh, imbalance. There's a huge trade deficit. Uh, 
uh, U.S. vis-à-vis -vis Europe. And this is a, a good way to predict protectionist trends. Structurally speaking, when there's a bilateral deficit, that uh, means that you won't uh, have a move towards uh, protectionism. And I think that's a very important shortcoming when it comes to the economic uh, recovery plans. One last point, because I've uh, run through my time. There are some persisting disagreements in the EU and the recovery plan and the national recovery plans have not helped to reduce this intra-European imbalance between North and South. There is a trade imbalance and there is a deep uh, intellectual disagreement on budgetary rules, for example. I wrote uh, with some other uh, authors that it was necessary to start uh, reforming the budgetary uh, rules and uh, reform things that haven't worked at all, the 3% and so on. One needs to focus on what, in my view, is the essential point in terms of indebtedness in Europe. That is the sovereignty of debt. And this hasn't been solved at all. I think economists have clearly shown this. Uh, the homogeneous, the homogeneous country uh, rule that applies to all countries at 3% and so on, it simply doesn't work. And I'll revert to that perhaps later on. Thank you very much. The recovery plan, will it stimulate the structural growth? Well, it's not easy to achieve that. That's a key question, but I don't think we have a, any answer pro tem. I'd like to put this question to the Minister of the Economy of Portugal. Sir, what about the recovery plan? Will it increase potential growth in each country? And what about the current situation in Portugal? I think everyone would be interested in that. What is the health situation in Portugal, the economic situation? And how are you going to use the EU funds which will be um, allocated to Portugal? Thank you very much for the question. Good afternoon. Maybe I'll speak English, because I see there is simultaneous... Uh, so I'll be speaking in English. Your question. Uh, I would say that the health situation has been conditioning very much the economic and social situation in Portugal, like in other countries. Of course, we are seeing that uh, what's happening with COVID and the variants that have been appearing recently is that Portugal is more at a par with the United Kingdom, to which we are very close, than with Central Europe. So in uh, uh, late December, January, we got the British variant becoming uh, very dominant in the country, which represented a very severe increase of cases. And we had to go through a very strict lockdown in the first contract, uh, uh, in the first quarter of this year, which had a very significant impact in our economic output. Uh, as we uh, got better, Central Europe got worse because the variant was, was going there. And uh, if a month ago we were the country with the lowest incidence in, uh, of COVID-19 in Europe, in the European Union, sorry, uh, what we are now seeing is that the Delta variant has become dominant during the uh, month of uh, June, and uh, uh, the cases are again increasing. The good news is that as vaccination progresses, uh, we are seeing that whilst uh, the, the number of cases are increasing, the number of hospitalizations and deaths are crawling, uh, which means that vaccines are effective. They are significantly effective in respect of people who have the, the two jabs of uh, whatever vaccine, uh, which uh, uh, spells good news for the coming months. As the rest of Europe, as Portugal continues to uh, implement the vaccination plans at the very uh, significant rates that we are now achieving, I think we will be able to deal with COVID in a manner which was different from what happened last, last year. 
And last year, as we all know, uh, the uh, healthcare situation was mostly managed by non-pharmaceutical measures, namely lockdowns and other constraints to economic activity, which had a very significant impact on the output of the economy as a whole by affecting at the same time the uh, demand side and the supply side of the economy. And my point here is that I think that both in Portugal and in other countries, the uh, negative impact of the, this uh, economic contraction was not as severe as everyone feared. What we have seen is that once we lifted the restrictions, firms could react and immediately respond to increased demand. We have seen that in industry, our exports of goods uh, actually uh, are increasing in, 2000, in late 2020 and early 2021 in comparison to what happened in 2019 even. Uh, we have seen that investment is continuing very strongly, construction continues to, to occur, so these are good news. Why was this possible? Why are we reacting much better to this crisis than we did before? And I think this is a good point for our discussion. We did so because we managed collectively the impact of this crisis within the European Union with an approach which I must believe has surprised me and I believe others of other observers too. Actually, uh, the Union reacted very swiftly the European Central Bank very quickly released monetary uh, policy to make sure that we continue to be able to flow money to the uh, economy and provide liquidity to firms. The, uh, the uh, Europe uh, suspended the uh, budgetary restrictions in the euro area, allowing countries to respond in earnest to uh, supporting jobs and supporting firms. Uh, which was important. On, in the respect of state aid, we also uh, uh, provided a temporary framework which allowed this sort of support to be done and we have avoided the worst. And now that we are projecting the uh, re uh, getting out of the crisis, I think we also must recognize that the European Union played a very significant role there. Uh, if we talk about how vaccination is progressing in earnest now in the second quarter of this year, we know that this was due to the fact that we decided to purchase collectively. The European Commission has been criticized very dramatically about the way it has purchased vaccines and how we supposedly were delayed in comparison to the United Kingdom or the United States. The truth is that after some hiccups, which probably occurred because the Union had never undertaken such a task, we are now deploying two countries at the same, to all countries, all member states, at the same rate, vaccinations, and we are get, get ensuring uh, coverage of most of the European population. We also concentrated and focused on restoring the single market. And I think that's another topic which is very important. We talked about the COVID certificate, which is, allows the free flow of people, which is a basic tenet of uh, the European Union and the single market, but we also uh, uh, decided to make a collective investment in the recovery of the uh, European Union's economy. We did so by approving next generation e EU. It was something that nobody could uh, believe possible uh, even a year ago. And uh, the decision is very significant because it means the Union is undertaking uh, a decision to provide a very significant economic stimulus in the coming years. At the same time, in all the continent, uh, public and private investments will be providing a stimulus to the economy. And we will be doing so by targeting investments which are required for us to tackle the challenges of the future of the European Un Union's economy. Okay. And I think this is also very good because, to, just to finalize, I think we realize that the uh, single market is actually one of the most valuable uh, assets that the European Union provides to its citizens and its companies. Uh, and we have realized that if the single market is not buoyant, then we are all affected. Right. We all have, have a vested interest in making sure that the European economy progresses fast and recovers swiftly. Mm. This is true certainly for Portugal or Spain or other southern European economies. But it is also true to Germany or Denmark, 
which export 60 percent of uh, of their exports to European to the European mm. Union we, or to Portugal and uh, the Netherlands, which exports around 70 percent oui. of its exports to uh, to the European Union. Mer Merci There's beaucoup, no, Monsieur le Ministre. Uh, uh, healthy European economy. No single country can have a healthy situation if the European single market is not working. Oui, oui. Uh -huh. So to conclude, I think that uh, the uh, next generation EU package and the, our national recovery plan is aligned with uh, a strategy for the recovery of the European Union. And it's uh, the way it uh, is uh, being designed in each different country is addressing specific topics in our country. I, I'm a firm believer that it will provide the uh, the ability to accelerate change and to make sure mm. that we get the foundations for a more competitive uh, European economy, which is more uh, friendly of the environment, which is more digitalized, which allows us to maintain comp uh, international competitiveness, and uh, by doing so, oui. ensuring that in Europe we can continue to provide okay. a very uh, high level of uh, welfare and prosperity to our citizens voilà. in the most equitable Merci, manner. Le so I think it was a terrible là. year uh, which tested all our capabilities, but I think, uh, if I may say so, that the European Union came stronger out of it. Okay, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. C'était assez uh, détaillé, merci. Thank you very much for this very detailed statement. You spoke about the single market. The single market was interrupted at a given point in time last year. There were all sorts of bans, export bans on certain products. And that also showed the limits of this uh, desire uh, to indulge in really free trade. Uh, Mr. Klein, I'll put that question to you. Did something change because of the pandemic? Did something really basic change in Europe? Do you think that Brussels has been given much more power at the European level? Yes. Given the pandemic, the EU has acquired new meaning and it's acquired new, a new dimension. Yes. In remarkable progress has been made. We have this plan, Next Generation EU, and uh, the U.S. has its plan as well, and huge expenditure has been provided for on both sides of the Atlantic. And this is very important when it comes to getting the economy going again. I think the EU next generation can play a remarkable role. Then, of course, we have the issue of community debt, EU debt, when it comes to the amount borrowed by states, it'll be paid back by the states. As to the other part of the debt, it will be reimbursed through taxes, European level taxes, and that's something that's very new. I, of course, I agree that taxes are problematical, but they may be taxes at the border, they may be a CO2 taxes, so all these are very new innovations. Something has changed in a deep-seated way. Now, having noted all these changes, will this last? Or will we just revert to the preceding situation after all these plans? Some countries uh, say this is some, these changes are just due to the pandemic, but not all countries are in the same situation. They're different economies, uh, depending on the EU country. I think what was necessary was to show solidarity, and uh, that was more difficult to achieve. Is this a, a really Hamilton-like moment? The Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S., Hamilton, who uh, was very much in favor of the uh, federal level, and uh, the states at the time were heavily indebted in Alexander Hamilton. This was because of the War of Independence. He said that the federal level should take over this debt. 
and the federal level introduced uh, uh, import taxes. And that helped build the federal uh, structure of the U.S. Can this be done in Europe? Well, I don't know. We have very little time to discuss the matter and really develop the, the question. Will this be a lasting situation or is it just a one-off thing? Will we then revert to the situation that obtained before the pandemic? It will depend on the degree of divergence between the European countries. The differences grew because of the pandemic, but since the financial crisis and uh, since the 2010, 2014, 2015 crisis in the EU, in fact, differences between countries have uh, been reduced. And industrial capacity used to diverge a great deal in terms of the export market. Uh, there were differences too. The uh, level of uh, vocational training hasn't converged. Uh, great differences still arise. Productivity uh, levels are very different, and uh, public debt uh, also stands at different levels depending on the EU country. So we can see that some um, effects will really disrupt countries. However, countries in the south, including France, will have to make real efforts uh, to introduce better structural policies. There must be more investment to speed up growth. Structural reforms are required also to reduce the differences. Northern countries are not going to agree to send subsidies and funds to southern European countries if they don't uh, reform. Uh, we can develop all these issues uh, later on, if you like, because countries in the south as countries in the north uh, benefit from uh, a strong economic recovery. But uh, countries in the north can't obviously, won't obviously agree to keep sending funds to countries in the south. So I think two things are required. First. Structural policies will have to help to reduce these differences, and the next generation EU policy should be an opportunity to reduce differences too. This policy sh will lead to differentiated policies depending on the country, the region, and uh, the industrial development. And finally, and that will be my conclusion, it goes without saying that inflation will be important, emerging from a heavy debt likewise. Of course, advances will be given by the uh, European Central Bank, but uh, countries in the south will have to uh, pitch in as soon as possible. Thank you very much. In this context, if you think about the dominant policy, of course, countries in the north have called for a quick return to budgetary stringency within Europe, saying we cannot continue with uh, uh, this huge burden of debt. And in this context, your remarks are very relevant. So we've already really started. The governor of the German Central Bank wrote recently in the Financial Times that it was time to review the monetary policy. So these divergences, if we want to move beyond them, if we want to have a sustainable union and a, a, a sustainable area, we need to have the right structural policies. And we need to react from a, at a European level to any divergences. So I'd now like to hear from Denmark and Lika Fries. Uh, Lika, can you hear us, Lika? Hopefully you will have heard Olivier Klein talking about northern countries and southern countries. So, uh, you know, it was quite clear what he said. How do you see this uh, difference? Is it continuing to exist? Is it something that you see? Is it bigger between north and south uh, uh, in spite of what the northern countries want? And, you know, we could talk about Germany as well. I'd be interested in that. So this this determination to finance uh, 
the southern countries as part of solidarity. You know, this, this, is it a, an even bigger wish today in the north, in the Nordic countries? How have things changed during the pandemic? Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, one would have to say that at the moment, nobody is discussing what you are discussing in France, in Denmark, everybody is speaking about one thing, football. The atmosphere in Denmark is basically like in uh, 92, when uh, Denmark first voted no to the Maastricht Treaty, and then afterwards won the European Championship in football. And there was a Danish foreign minister who coined the expression, if you cannot join them, beat them. But to answer more specifically your question, no, I would say there hasn't really been a big change with regards to solidarity, at least not in my country, uh, when one looks upon the corona crisis. There is the clear sentiment, and as you know, Denmark is part of the uh, Frugal Four camp, and let me start by saying that I'm not in any way representing the Danish government, but there is a clear consensus in Denmark within the political spectrum that the recovery fund is a one-off. This was something that under great pressure, also because one could see also in Denmark that it would have had major repercussion on the single market and also on the ability to keep the EU together if one did not go along with the very sort of a novel idea of the recovery fund. But only at that specific moment in European integration it was due to COVID, so it's not in any way is something that the uh, that in Denmark people would support to become a permanent exercise. However, one will have to say if one really wants to push that agenda, I think there are two sort of uh, points that I'd like to raise here with you. I mean, basically, you could say must win battles uh, for for the EU. The first one is that one should definitely make sure that the money set aside for the recovery fund actually is spent in the right way. So the money should go to climate change and obviously also the digital transformation. If suddenly the money goes down the drain or goes to other areas, then obviously the frugal camp will be able to say, we told you so, this would not work. That would be, sorry, I, I am half German, it would be gefundenes Fressen. So it's extremely important that if one wants to have a permanent recovery fund, that the money is spent according to the rules. So that's the first, I would say, really important thing. The second thing is that one should obviously then also think about how one could construct uh, some kind of a grand bargain here. And I can at least sort of uh, see one possible grand bargain, which is linked to climate change and also you could say the single market. If there would be sort of greater ambitions on climate change, carbon reductions, energy efficiency, and also greater market access, for instance, within services, I mean, that could somehow then be traded towards an acceptance, uh, possibly, from the Nordic countries uh, to uh, uh, some kind of fiscal capacity. I, I think that at least one would have to look into sort of areas like that in order to find sort of a possible grand bargain. But to be very frank, it will not be a walk in the park. There is, it rather be, you could say, a, a sort of climb up a very steep mountain because public support uh, in at least my own country is as follows that while well, people think that Denmark is already European champions with regards to sort of a crisis management, uh, opinion poll just spun, done by the European Council of Foreign Relations shows that in Denmark people think that we are the only country who did better than all the other countries. <laughs> so, so that's the sentiment. And there is also that feeling that, yes, we are a staunch supporter of European integration. Actually, in that uh, opinion poll I just referred to, Denmark by far is the country together with Poland that has the strongest support for EU membership. France is at the other end of, of that, uh, of that uh, sort of opinion poll. But the support in Denmark goes towards a single market, not towards sort of a permanent uh, recovery fund or Schengen or defense. Because remember, and that'll be my final remark, I started referring to 92. That 92 referendum towards the Maastricht Treaty ended up with Denmark then obtaining four opt-outs towards the European Union. And even though it's so many years ago, we still have the opt-outs, and that's basically, you could say, the overall right. sentiment within right. Denmark with regards to the European Union. Back to you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Lika. Thank you very much, Lika. It was very clear. So no recovery plan that is permanent at European level. Uh, in the opinion of the Danes. Now, uh, you are an expert.
expert in competition with Florence Ninan, so competition with the United States, with China. Have we got the right equipment? Are we properly fitted out to to face that competition from a company point of view, which is your field of expertise? Are we European champions? Do we need European champions? Or is it a good thing for Europe? Or is it a negative thing for consumers? You know, because uh, less competition uh, is better. I think that when we talk about competition in the European Union, there's a kind of a, 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 a big split, if you like. Some people want more control for others and less control for people inside the European Union. Somebody said one day uh, that uh, monopolies were like children. We love them. We love our own monopolies, but we don't like other people's monopolies. So, you know, we c control powerful people from abroad, that's what we like, but we think less about how we boost powerful players in the European Union. So less control, that's what we want. When we look at what happened last year during the COVID crisis, I think we all have to pay tribute to the remarkable responsiveness of the European Commission. Uh, it gave, it defined its temporary framework, it approved uh, state aid, uh, uh, within the space of a few days, and this meant that the community economy could uh, could uh, could uh, could uh, with stand the crisis. With state, there are state controls, however, they are applied to Europe and not necessarily in China and the United States. So we can see that there are companies that are very much helped outside of the European Union and then come and invest in the European Union. So we're not talking about a, a field with the same level of weapons. So the European Commission last year published a white paper interested in this uh, competitive distortion that we have. So you've got companies that are helped abroad and uh, companies that are not helped as much within uh, European Union. So there was a focus on you know, this idea of having equal weapons and things will change. We're not there yet, but uh, the subject has been placed on the table. And what is the relevant market? Do we have forbid we've forbidden the Simmons and Alstom deal, for example? Yes, that's a great transition. It's the same thing. We're asking for less control there, or at least some people are. The merger of 2019 was forbidden by the European Union. France and Germany uh, were not happy. They thought that the rules were obsolete. They meant that we couldn't uh, have this world leader emerge in Europe, uh, to a uh, world leader able to uh, fight uh, the Chinese, uh, etc. So the Commission said, well, that there were competition rules that had to be followed and that the solutions were not necessarily in competition rules. So we need to revise these rules, especially with respect to the right kind of market. So it worked on a communication that dates back to 1987. So, you know, uh, the system should have been modernized a bit now. We need to consider that competition is worldwide and not just community based and that we need to have more prospective analyses, not just look at in two years time, but in three, four, five years, what are the market perspectives? Uh, what are the prospects uh, of, of big uh, gi giants uh, emerging? So, you know, th that's what uh, some people who wanted less control said. And then there were other people who said, OK, be careful. There are a lot of acquisitions. There are a lot of startups. They're very innovative. They're being made by giants, uh, digital giants, but also in the field of biotechnology. Uh, this is a very um, hot topic today, a very... So these companies don't have much turnover, but they've got a lot of turnover, they, they've got a lot of potential and they're not very well controlled. So the Commission changed its doctrine recently and said, OK, now, even if we're not at the notification threshold, they operations can be reviewed and we will review them even if there is no control. So there was a first operation that was carried out. It was sent by France in particular to the European Commission in the blood test uh, field. So we are making progress. And then perhaps a last point, because I know that time is ticking. Another subject that I find that's very interesting is the digital smart exact regulation that's being discussed at community level. 
the idea is to consider that a digital that there are digital gatekeepers who are quite restrictive they have such a power that it's impossible to fight against them but once again i'd just like to introduce another idea these so before we fought against uh, you know legacy monopolies uh, today we're attacking companies that have a, 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 a critical size thanks to innovation. So I'm wondering about the ability of Europe to encourage this innovation instead of discourage it. Now, of course, the rules are going to be applied to extra community companies, but will it not discourage community companies? You know, maybe they will not reach the critical threshold size. Thank you, Florence. Paul Yeager, we've talked about companies, we've talked about governments. So this is, you know, the elite project of Europe, but there are citizens as well. You have information about what the citizens, especially in France, think at the moment about Europe. So we'll get there in the end. Yes, so French citizens are always critical of everything. But if they, you know, 70% of them say that they are dissatisfied with their government, with the way the crisis was managed. But in spite of that, they're much softer on the European institutions because the European institutions manage the crisis better. And if, for example, we find that 65% of the French people feel that the European Union went too quickly in terms of vaccines and tests, at Euro European level, the rest of citizens believe that the European institutions acted properly in the right way. So the, there's a European feeling that has progressed incredibly in France. The trust in European institutions was uh, increased by 10 points. So people are more trusting of European institutions. 83% of French people today would like Europe to have more means to deal with crises. That's 83%. And if we look at the major European themes, the French, generally speaking, support them massively. So 70% are in favor of the strengthening of the euro. 65% are in favor of strengthening trade rules. 71% are in favor of European defense, and 65% are in favor of a, a European policy for migration, and 71% are in favor of energy. The only subject for the French that they're not very happy about uh, is expansion, the arrival of new countries in the European Union. There, the French are less favorable for that, about that idea. But it's a very specific period at the moment, this crisis period. And during this period, um, people are more for Europe. And another point that I'd like to detail concerns leadership. And to answer your question, you know, what's new in the European Union faced with adversity? I think that the leadership that European institutions have shown is absolutely remarkable. And we need to think about that. If we analyze the leadership of our European leaders compared with what's happening in big companies, there are points that they share, that they have in common. So major European leaders really showed that they were great leaders in four ways. And these are points that we uh, analyze as uh, critical. So the first point is the taking into account of multiple decision making. The way the European Union managed its relationship with the member states, but also with the regions and with the field as well, the way it made its solutions, that was very remarkable, the way it went about things. The second point is its long-term vision. The European Union really uh, proved that it could have a remarkable long-term vision. The third point concerns the importance given to innovation in all of the measures taken by the European Union, tests, vaccines, but also the recovery plan, and the importance given to digital questions. That's Those are things that have to be underlined as well. And the last point, European leadership consists in taking into account the stakeholders and making sure that as part of the recovery plan, there is something that's very inclusive. It includes the people in the field, it includes fragile populations, it includes 
uh, individual development plans. So for all of these reasons, I believe that the reaction of the European Union and the reaction of the leaders in Europe in this period of adversity was remarkable. So is this because money is coming? Is this because you know the money is there on the table people don't really understand where the european money is coming from is that one explanation no i think on the one hand you know there's there's been a boost you know for the next generation eu plan created by a collected pan european effort with France leading it. And then, of course, there are the rules. The rules, uh, you, some of you reminded us of the rules, the fact that we've got to be careful. We've got to have structural con reforms. We've got to have convergence. We, the funds attributed have to be compatible with the efforts that we have to make in terms of climate or, or digital transformation. So there are lots of efforts being made, but there are rules, and the, these are clear, and they are voted democratically. Don't forget that the European Parliament voted uh, for, to, on the new European climate plan, 70% for. So we've got a, a, a community of vision that is pan-European. Now, Olivier, do you think that there are requirements for structural reforms as part of that plan? I don't really see it, to be honest, but somebody in Brussels, is somebody in Brussels asking uh, France to make a, a pension reform? Um, I don't think so, but what you, when you look at the next generation EU plan, clearly aid will only be given in exchange for structural policies. In other words, how is it negotiated? Well, I'm not sure. Perhaps Martin knows this, but what Philip Martin, sorry, but the aid will only be unlocked in exchange for this, and that seems to me to be a good idea, because otherwise we'd, we'll find it difficult. You know, unless you know the right investments are made to reindustrialize Europe. Um, I'd like to ask another question, uh, and this is to the Minister of Economy in Portugal. Are you still with us, Minister? So, so a last question. Very good. So please, yes, a question and, and, and a quick answer, please. So in your opinion, the recovery plan, the next generation EU plan, should it be a permanent mechanism or not? Uh, well, in a nutshell, no. But I, I'll, I'll make two comments to, to justify that. First of all, you must realize that the response to the crisis, the emergency response with which governments took to support jobs, to provide support to firms uh, during the uh, COVID uh, crisis was uh, funded by national governments themselves which is why public debt levels are increasing so fast across Europe. That's one topic. Next Generation EU is not focused on responding to the emergency, is not focused on uh, the North be having solidarity with the South. It is investing in the, common, the foundations of our common future prosperity. We want to tackle climate change, we must do it on a continent-wide basis, and we must prepare our uh, energy systems, our transportation systems, our buildings, our industry to make sure of that. That's one topic. Now, I don't see the next generation EU as becoming permanent, but I think that, as others have commented, we notice, uh, and this, uh, this crisis has provided us as a lesson, that there are some challenges which we all collectively face that can only be effectively dealt with uh, on an European level. If we want to build the resilience in our industrial systems, if we want to tackle climate change, if we want to face digital transitions, these are investments that it's not for a country to do uh, themselves, but common. And finally, we must appreciate that our companies, our firms in Europe, are competing globally with uh, other firms. And we are trying to identify who is actually developing the technologies which will be critical for the future competitiveness of firms. And we know that this will be on the digital area, going into the Internet of Things, supercomputing, cloud computing, uh, applied to industry and the like. And we must re recognize this. The Chinese firms 
have support from their governments. American firms have support from their governments. And if we think that the, uh, Europe can live uh, competitively only with the results that firms generate, we will not go there. So we know that we have a common interest in supporting investment in innovation and new technologies, and this is a common challenge. So uh, Lick Fries was talking about the grand bargain, and I think that the grand bargain should be where are the uh, uh, investments that uh, Europe must do, and that probably should be a priority for everyone and not just for member states alone, okay. or we will all be losers. Merci, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you very much, Minister. Philippe uh, Martin, perhaps you can say something. What the Minister is asking is some kind of target industrial policy. This costs money. So the budgetary rules, you know, are we uh, doing things going back too quickly to rigid rules uh, in order to reduce debt? How should we reform the rules? So just a point about the debate around uh, next generation EU, is it permanent or not? I think there's an intermediate point, and we understand the divergence between the southern countries and the northern countries. We have to consider, and, and based on the experience, uh, what's happening in Italy, you know, we, uh, this is the elephant in the room, isn't it? It's an instrument that has to be used as a kind of contingency plan. We need to agree that for the next big crisis, which whether it's a health crisis, uh, geopolitical, military or whatever, we will have an instrument and know how to use it. It's not an instrument to be used outside of crises. It's, it's something that we know we have for crisis periods. That's, that's the intermediate point. Coming back to budgetary rules. Yes, that's what I fear indeed. We haven't made the mistake up until now, but effectively, in a situation where the interest rates are very low, you were saying that you know the money is falling from trees. Well, it's not really falling from trees because we're in a situation where we are oversaving in Europe. We've got lots uh, of money in our current accounts and savings accounts, so it's normal that we this this money be used for making investments. It's the right moment when the interest rates are low. It's the right time to make investments in the environment, in industry. So from that point of view, it's really the right point in time to spend. And of course, there has to be some kind of a yield. Now, our proposal, of course, is to get rid of the 70, uh, uh, 3% rules. The 3% is either too strict or not strict enough, especially during growth periods, high growth periods. So one of the things that economists have promoted, including myself, is to have a rule that provides objectives in terms of reducing the public debt uh, within five years, let's say, and implement the idea of implementing these rules in terms of nominal expenditure. In other words, having a ceiling for the next five years for uh, nominal expenditure. And this needs to be stabilized at macroeconomic level. It's something that's quite understandable. It, you know, citizens can understand this. We've been talking about democracy, citizenship. It's, I, I challenge anybody in this room to explain what the budgetary rules are. You know, many ministers of economy are. Now, I don't know whether this is the case of our Portuguese minister. He will probably contradict me. But nobody really understands these rules. And it's not normal from a democratic point of view that the most important important of uh, economic policy is not understood, not only by MPs, and citizens, but also by certain ministers. We need to simplify those rules. They don't work. Thank you. So that will be the last thing, because I'm being told uh, that we've reached the end. So thank you very much for being with us. Ms. Minister Lika Fries, thank you for being with us online. When we talk about Europe, thank you.